He's worthy tonight. Hallelujah. Praise God. Looking at your Bibles tonight, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23. This lesson 2 of a series called Fruitful Character. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And then James 15, 1 to 5, Jesus said, I am the true vine. And my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. Would you pray with me tonight? Lord, I love you. I thank you, Lord, for your people that are here tonight and our visitors, God. We're asking you, Lord, to speak to us. Speak through me, your vessel, that our ears be anointed to hear what the Spirit's saying to the church, Lord, and we'll fail not to give you the praise in Jesus' name. Somebody said, in Jesus' name. And you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Lesson two, we're dealing with our purpose tonight, and then the foundation of fruitful character. Our purpose is to be fruitful. That's the first commandment. The first commandment that God gave man was not, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That's a great commandment, and it is the greatest commandment. But the first commandment is found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28, when the Lord said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. Everybody say, Be fruitful. Be fruitful, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. We are supposed to be fruitful. To develop a Christian fruitful character means that we are fruitful in every aspect of our life. You were not just put on this earth to take up space and receive blessings. How many used to go with your father or mother to the grocery store and you saw the gumball machine and you asked dad or mom for a quarter every time you saw the gumball machine. And dad would say to me, I don't have a quarter. And I knew good and well he had a quarter. I just knew he didn't want to give me a quarter. So I asked every time, because there was a chance, Brother Garrett, eventually he was going to give me that quarter. And not most of the time he did. But we are here tonight not just to receive blessings, not to constantly pray to God with the give me. Lord, give me this and give me that. Uh, Lord, I need you to do this for me. I need you to do that for me. We're not just here to take up space and receive blessings. And we're here to bear. We're here to bring forth fruit. We are here to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. We are here to also be men and women who fulfill the great commission, which is to go into the highways and the byways to compel people to come to Jesus. There should be some part of you having been filled with the Holy Ghost that feels a compulsion 
to bear fruit, to produce something. As Hannah did when she was praying in the book of 1 Samuel, she cried unto the Lord because she was barren, the Bible says. And she wanted a child. And she was speaking with such anguish in her prayer that old Eli thought that she was drunk. The Bible says that he seems to bear out by the wording of it. We read it in the King James. It says that he uh, marked her mouth. But what they say is that what that really means, a euphemism for that man of God slapped that woman on the face because she was praying to God with such earnestness. Why? Because she wanted children. She wanted to be productive. I don't know about you tonight, but I want to be productive. I don't always reach that goal, but I'm working on it. Because you see, manifesting a fruitful character is a lifetime process. It takes time. You have to grow, and it involves a cycle. It's a state of constant planting and nourishing and cultivating and harvesting and reproducing and doing it over and over again. And you get a harvest and you don't eat your whole harvest. You have to save some seed in order to plant it again so you can have another time of harvest and another season. I don't know what kind of season you're going through right now, but whatever it is, at the end there's going to be a harvest. And you need to make sure not to spend all of your harvest by consuming it, but also by saving some and putting it back because God wants us to continue to plant and to sow and to water the earth and see great fruit come forth. And this process has to be active in our lives. And when it is, there is a sense of accomplishment and fulfillment. There's nothing like knowing that you have been a part of somebody coming to Jesus. That you've been the one that prayed them through to the Holy Ghost and you saw God change their life. There's nothing like being a part of somebody's life when you've invested in somebody and put time in them and invested in their future, whether it's in the church or in your own family and your children. And you see them attain blessings because some of them blessings that they get, some of those good things that come to them, you can take some kind of reward in that knowing that I had a part in them doing that. That's part of being fruitful. The Bible said that Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. We're not asked to be the root. We're not asked to be the trunk. We're just asked to be the branches. We're not supposed to support the work of the Spirit. We're just supposed to do the work of the vine, the work of the vine. We are the branches. We are to bear the fruit of the Spirit tonight. The fruit of the Spirit is necessary for you to have a fruitful character when you serve the Lord. So apple trees, they don't produce they don't produce oranges, grapes, they don't produce strawberries. We know that pear trees, they don't produce figs and persimmons, they don't produce pears. You get what you sow. You will reap what you sow. Look at somebody and tell them that you'll reap what you sow. So my grandma used to tell us, you'll reap what you sow and be sure your sins will find you out. So, because of that truth that you get apples when you plant an apple tree, we are to bear the right kind of fruit. And the fruit that we bear is consistent with the seed that's in us. If the fruit that you bear is gossip, lying, cheating, being unfaithful to God, then that is the seed that has been sown in you, that you've allowed to produce. The Bible lets us know that what we think about will come out of our mouth. It gets into our heart and into our spirit. It's a seed. So what you listen to, what you focus on, who you hear, if it's negativity all the time, eventually negativity will come out of you in every area of your life. And the problem with negativity is, it, it grows. It doesn't just stop with one person. It's a seed that begins to grow in other people's lives. It's like a weed that gets in the ground. I've got rocks around my house this year, and, and I haven't had time to go out and get the weed killer. And i got weeds going up over these rocks, and it's making me angry every time I see them because I know the amount of time and the, the money that we put in getting that looking nice, but I want you to know it's because there's weeds in there. 
Bible lets us know that there was an event in the New Testament. Jesus was telling the story how that a man went out and he sowed in his field. And over in the nighttime, somebody came and sowed tares in the field. And the Bible says very distinctly that an enemy hath done this. You be careful who's sowing seeds and tares in your life. They'll be an enemy to you if you're not careful. They can destroy you with their speech and with their words. Words have such power that when you speak the wrong kind of word, it'll elicit the wrong kind of response in you. Don't let negative things come into your heart, into your spirit, and into your mind because we are supposed to bear fruit that is consistent with the seed inside of us. And if you have the gift of the Holy Ghost tonight, then you are supposed to bear the fruit of what Jesus really is. I don't know about you, but I want to bear that kind of fruit. The fruit of His Spirit that's planted inside of me that I received when I was born again of water and of Spirit. That's the fruitful character of the Spirit. That's what we want to see reproduced in our lives. The fruit of the Spirit. That Spirit that's in Christ Jesus. He said if it dwells in you, it's like a seed dwelling there. Someday there's going to be a trumpet and that means your body's going to rise up and meet the Lord in the air and be with the dead, the dead have gone on before us. It's going to be a great, glorious day, but it's because that seed is inside of you and planted there and waiting for that great and glorious day. So that's what we're doing tonight. We are reproducing seed, the seed of the Spirit. You're reproducing some type of seed tonight. I don't know what it is that you've allowed into your spirit, but whatever it's in your spirit has been manifesting itself. You can hide it for a while from other people, but in your private time and when you're by yourself, you know what seed's coming out of your mouth. You know what thoughts are coming to your mind. You know what you're doing that nobody else knows about. And it might be righteous and holy and it might be profane, but whatever it is, it's a result of the seed that you've allowed to purchase in your spirit. The Bible lets us know that we are, when we have the Holy Ghost, we receive His Spirit. And I don't know about you tonight, but I want that spirit to be manifest in my life all the time. There are not nine different fruits of the spirit tonight. I'm going into the fruit now. and talking about reproducing, but what are we reproducing? We're reproducing fruit. There are not nine different fruits of the spirit. There are nine different gifts of the spirit, but they operate by one spirit. It's one fruit of the Spirit operating by one Holy Ghost. Uh, how many are in this room? 75 people, maybe. We all pretty much in this room have the Holy Ghost. Does that mean there's 80 different little Holy Ghosts in here? No, it's the same Holy Ghost that we all have. It's one fruit of the Spirit, and it starts with love. It's one fruit with nine different aspects. Each piece of that fruit has aspects that are different from the other. The seed, the flesh, the peel, the stem. When all these aspects are in order, then the fruit is available to be used for its intended use. Have you ever gone to eat an apple and it was too sour? Well, my grandpa had crab apples on his place in Kokomo. In the summertime, I'd love to, to taste them crab apples. I didn't like what it did to me later on, but I liked them at the time. They had a cherry tree in the yard. I love that cherry tree. One of my most saddest memories was the day I came to my grandfather's house and they were chopping down the cherry tree because they'd got some kind of blight on it, some kind of disease. And we could no longer get and pick the cherries from it and eat them. But I loved those trees. I loved what, what was there. And, and sometimes you'll eat, I, you know, how many like bananas? And you eat a ripe banana and it's just too mushy. It's disgusting. Nobody wants that business. My wife had a bunch of mushy bananas in the house the other day, said she's going to make brownies. I'm still waiting on them brownies, dear. <laughs> but there are various aspects of the Spirit. When all those aspects are working in your life correctly, and they're in order, then we are available for our intended purpose. The word, the word fruit comes from a Greek word, karpos. And it means fruit as plut. Another word for it is harpezo. It means to seize, to catch, 
to pluck, to pull, to take by force. The fruit of the Spirit. It denotes action, showing us that the fruit of the Spirit is not automatically given to us. It's something that you have to allow action to take part in your life. You are involved in the process. The Spirit of God, the fruit of the Spirit, is there for you to take, to pluck, and to display it in your life. But you are involved in the process. You're involved in the growing of it. You get to determine what kind of nourishment the tree of your life gets. Do you determine? How do you determine that? You determine that by what you allow into your spirit. Whether you read the Bible or pray, whether you involve yourself in negative or positive conversations, whether you focus on those things that are just and holy and pure and righteous, or whether you focus on other things. And the first word that's mentioned when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, as you know, is love. Love. Much has been said and written concerning love. There's an old poem I like. It says, come live with me and be my love and we will all the pleasures prove. It's an old poem that keeps on going and going and going. The Apostle John said that God is love. Martin Luther King Jr., he was speaking to an angry crowd one day after the KKK had bombed his home in 1956. And he said, I want you to Love your enemies. Be good to them. Love them. And let them know that you love them. We must meet hate with love. What we are doing is right. What we are doing is just. And God is with us. Go home with love in your hearts. With faith. And with God in front. We cannot lose. That seems very hard to do sometimes. When things around you. You're struggling with stuff. And things seem to be. Uh, just piling up against you and you have people that are attacking you. But Martin Luther King Jr. laid out a principle here from the Scriptures and that is just to love your enemies. The Bible said, do good to them that despitefully use you. Mr. Rogers, I like Mr. Rogers. He said, love isn't a state of perfect caring. It is an active noun-like struggle. To love someone is to strive to accept that person exactly the way he or she is right here and right now. And to go on caring even through times that may bring us pain. How many know that relationship brings you pain sometimes? Just look at somebody and say, I still love you. I love you. I want to strangle you sometimes, but I love you. My wife told me one day that pure worship is an outward physical action to your inward extraordinary love for Jesus. Pure worship is an outward physical action to your inward extraordinary love for Jesus. I hope we love Jesus in an extraordinary fashion. I hope that our love for Jesus consumes us, compels us. The Apostle Paul said love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. That's why we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourself. We're supposed to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength in our neighbor as ourself. D.L. Moody, he said that joy is love exalted. Peace is love in repose. Long-suffering is love enduring. Gentleness is love in society. Goodness is love in action. Faith is love on the battlefield. Meekness is love in school. And temperance is love in training. We can take all those different things that Mr. Moody wrote so long ago, we could preach about every one of them. Faith is love on the battlefield. It's when you're in the middle of the battle, when you still retain your faith, when you know that you have the love of God working in your life or not. When you can raise up that shield of faith and trust and know that faith is love on a battlefield. I, I like that. I like the fact that God is love. And there are three 
different Greek words for love used in the New Testament. There are actually four. One of them is storge, but it's not found in the New Testament. But the first one is eros. Eros is that sensual love recognized in the stories of Adam and Eve, Jacob and Rachel, the Song of Solomon, various others throughout the Bible. It is that romantic love. How many remember that romantic love? Nobody? I hope you experienced romantic love when you were dating your spouse-to-be. I know Daniel, he's nodding his head, so I know he did. Some of them got it going on right now. I remember my wife walked through those doors on my wedding day, and I was speechless. She thought I was mad. I wasn't mad. I was stunned. <laughs> Beautiful, wonderful day. Then there's filio. This is the love that refers to spontaneous natural affection. It's a love that a friend has for a friend. See, eros is a, is a good love, but it's, it only goes so far. Filio is a higher level of love, that friendship love. And I'm hoping today that you're friends with your spouse, amen? <laughs> the church at Philadelphia had this type of love. They had brotherly love. Charles Marshall Pickering says that this love has more feeling than reason. And I found that to be true. When you love somebody that's your friend, they don't care. It doesn't matter what's going on. You're their friend no matter what. Whether they're right or wrong, you're their friend. Uh, how many have had friends that disappointed you, but you still stayed their friend? How many have friends that you disappointed, and they still stayed your friend? Because they had that filial love for you. And then there's the agape love. This is the affectionate and beloved love. It is a type of love that, God, that, that, that Paul is referring to when he speaks in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, that we're supposed to have love, the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's that agape love, that divine love. It is the fruit of the Spirit is love. It goes beyond our love for God even and deals with our love for people because when you have the love that God has, God's love isn't about a self-serving kind of love, but it's a love that serves other people. Do you know that God's love causes Him to serve the needs of other people? People. Jesus said that this type of love would be lacking in the end times. He said because the love of many would, lack, would wax cold. Because, why? Because iniquity abounds. What's iniquity? Iniquity is that hidden thing in your heart that nobody knows about. Because you've got that iniquity abounding in you, always discounting and distrusting and thinking negative about what somebody's doing, never giving the benefit of the faith, but always the benefit of doubt. So he said, because of that reason, in the last days, Jesus said this, Matthew 24, the love of many shall wax cold. When a person gives their life over to sin and iniquity, their love and concern for people becomes cold and distant. It becomes selfish in what they're doing. You can't change their mind, no matter what, because they're pursuing what they want to pursue in willful sin and iniquity. Jesus said to his disciples, now this, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples when you have love one to another. Why don't you turn to somebody again and just tell them, I love you. I love you. And it's not just three words that we say. Because you can say I love you all the time, but love in action is what we're talking about tonight. That agape Love is that love in action. Our testimony and our witness are enhanced when we manifest love to one another, when we demonstrate our love for one another. Jesus said, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. That's what he said to do. And he said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. What? A difference it would make in our homes, in our relationships, in our marriages, in our churches, and in our communities if we would love each other as Jesus loves us. Oh God, help us to love one another as you love us. The only thing that will bring that kind of transformation 
is if you let God's love manifest through you. I pray this prayer often. Lord, let your love be made, be made manifest in my life. Manifest your love through me. Manifest your grace through me. Manifest your power through me. Because I want God's Spirit to work through me. I don't want to be seen just for Stephen Kuntzman, but the Christ that's in me, which the Bible says is the hope of glory. That's the only hope of glory, by the way, is the Christ that's in you. And His love is pure and it's unpolluted this evening. Luke chapter 4, 11, verse 42 Woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and all manner of herbs and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. Their actions of love were predicated upon what was in it for them. And you love people because you know you'll get something back from them? That's not love. It's not the kind of love that Jesus has. They want those things. They, they want the judgments of God or the, for the love of God, but they want it for their own merit. They only loved what would bring blessing to them. There are some decisions you make in life. Sometimes you make a choice to love somebody in a situation and you'll never be blessed by it in this life, you think. There will not be reward for it, apparent reward for loving Sometimes you'll love somebody and they will betray you. They will wound you. They will hurt you. They will try even to destroy you. And sometimes the people you help the most are the ones who try to hurt you the most. But you keep on loving people the way Jesus loved us. Because the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how he committed his love towards us. Before I could have any kind of goodness in me. By the way, we have no goodness in us. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But while we were in that state, He loved us. Do you understand the love that He had? meant that He was willing to face the possibility of rejection by you tonight? He loved you so much, even if you would reject Him, He still would love you. Even if you rejected Him tonight, and walked out the doors of this church and walked away from him, he would still love you. Now, God forbid that we would do that, but that's the kind of love that he has for us. It's pure. It's unpolluted. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 4 to 6, Paul told us that there was an unfeigned love of the brethren, a genuine love. It's without hypocrisy. He said in Romans chapter 12, 9, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. To dissimulate means to be hypocritical. To, be, to hide under a false appearance. And he was saying, don't let love be that way. There's something about someone that says, I love you, and you know when they say, I love you, that they really love you. That you don't got to question it. I've heard people tell me before, I love you. I'm thinking, I don't know about that. And you smile, that uncomfortable smile that says, but your actions are showing me something else. And the Lord, he says that, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's a sincere love that works for good. Romans 13, 10, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of a law. It works no ill to your neighbor. When you love people, you're doing everything you can to help people for their best. If you judge people, you have no time to love people. If you love people, if you judge people, you have no time to love people. That's why he said, let us not judge one another anymore. Let's just love each other. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 8, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. Paul was trying to prove the sincerity of the church at Corinthians, their love. And sometimes there are things that come into your life that will be God trying to prove your love for Him, for other people. And then love has no reason 
or conditions sometimes. It's without reason or condition. It comes from a sense of duty and principle as opposed to feeling and an attraction. See, love is a choice that you make. I was attracted to Anita when I first began dating her. And I knew pretty quick in the game where things were going to head. And um, I had a feeling, I had an attraction, but that is a shallow aspect of love. The love that God gives, gives you a sense of duty. And it's a principle that you live by. And it's not a love that comes because of obligation. You don't feel obligated to love. You love out of this sense of duty and principle because you love God completely and are compelled to manifest that love to Him and everybody else. Because of my love for her completely, I want to manifest that love to her. And so Paul wrote and said, For the love of Christ constraineth us. It compels you to reach out in love. That word constrain, that is, says that love is the glue that holds everything together. Have you ever heard about someone saying that that woman was the glue in her family? Or that man was the glue in their family, that patriarch? And when they or he or she died, the family splintered apart. It was because the glue was gone now. And so it takes work. But when that patriarch or that matriarch in a family passes away, somebody has to step up to the plate and say, we're going to love each other. We're not going to let our love dissolve. We're not going to let this glue dissolve. We're going to continue to let it hold us together. The Bible lets us know that God, in His love, has manifested His love towards us. He makes it known to us on a continual basis. And love holds everything completely together. The Bible says of Jesus that by Him all things in existence are consisting. They consist because of Him. In fact, if if Christ decided to take His attention off of this thing, it would totally dissemble. There would be no heaven and earth. There would be no universe because God had lost his attention, lost his focus on us, lost his desire. But he's never going to do that because God is love and he is the glue that holds the universe together. Because the purpose is for him to have a relationship with you and me tonight. So it constrains us. And love is not stagnant, but it's alive. And vibrant. How? By constantly reaching out to others in love. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, 12 to 13. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you, to the end that ye may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. But notice that, that the Lord maketh you to increase and abound in love one toward another. It's alive. It's vibrant. First John 3, 16 and 17. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shut up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? That is love that is alive and vibrant, continues to open up itself to other people. And if they see, if I see someone has a need, and I have the wherewithal to help them through that need, then I'm supposed to help them, because that is a manifestation of my love for that person and for God. You will not look back upon your life at the moments when you gave somebody something that blessed them and regret it. But you will look back on life at those missed opportunities where you didn't help somebody and you should have. When you should have done something in the spirit of love. And the love that we're talking about tonight, it's generous, it's selfless, it's sacrificing, and it's unconditional. It is a love that is given even if it is undeserved. Even if it's misunderstood, rejected, 
trampled upon and not returned. And there is such a thing as unrequited love. Uh, there are people that go through this entire life and never one time give a thought to serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, He loves them as surely as He loves you and me tonight. Romans 5, 8, But who God commend His love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's the same love that we are to manifest through the Spirit. God loves us knowing that we do not deserve it. Some will reject it. Others will misunderstand it. They will not and have not given their time to know Him, and so they don't know what real love is. When you know what real love is, you know what Martin Luther King said again, that hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Only love can drive out some of the things that you're facing in your life tonight. It's that love that comes from the Spirit. When you understand the greatness and degree of the undeserved love of God in your life, it becomes the example and the pattern for you. When you understand just what He did for you, what He has done to open doors for you because of His love for you, when you understand how He's opening doors now, it seems like sometimes doors are closing all around you and no doors will open, but that is also God's love. Because God has you in a place where He is sometimes protecting you and keeping you and saving you for a special moment. And so when God's love is displayed in your life, it's become part of your fruitful character. When I display and you display the love of God to other people, it's because I have begun to manifest that character in my life, the character of the fruit of the Spirit. And when you do that, you're filled. You are filled with the love of God. Ephesians 3, 16 and 19, that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to cover Him with all saints with His breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye may be filled with all the fullness of of God. How do I become full with all the fullness of God? I've got to have the love of God. I've got to be rooted and grounded in love tonight. Rooted and grounded. Growing up in Him. And when you have that, when you are filled with the love of God, then you'll seek peace and you'll speak unity among your brothers and your sisters. Ephesians chapter 4, again, Ephesians. I therefore, the prisoners of the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, forbearing one another in love. That leads to unity and that leads to peace. If you feel like there's not peace in your home, there's not peace on your job. There's not peace in the church. It's probably because there's not a whole lot of endeavoring in love. What the scripture said that love of God will hide a multitude of sins. It'll overlook some things. It'll hide it. Put it away. That means if I see somebody that has a defect, I overlook it. Guess what? If I can see their defects, you know for sure you can all see mine. And so that's why we are endeavoring by love to keep that unity and that peace going because we're rooted and grounded in the love of God. And when you do that, you become edified and the church becomes edified. Again, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. You want to be built up in Christ? Learn to love people. Manifest the love of God. Speak to Him and say, Jesus, no, don't just give me a revelation of your love for me, but put your love way down deep inside of me so that I can manifest that love. 
And so that's what he did when he filled you with the Holy Ghost. He gave you the fruit of the Spirit, and it starts out with love. And everything comes from that. It is expensive. He paid a great price for you to receive his love. He, a, he, he paid a great price for you tonight to have the Holy Ghost and be born again. The Bible says you are not your own, but you are bought with a price. Therefore, we're supposed to glorify God in our bodies. And so that's how we do it. We glorify him by our relationship with him in love. And then we're filled we are in a spirit of unity and peace. We've been edified, and now we are presentable. Ephesians chapter 5. I love the book of Ephesians. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. At this stage, it is a divine presentation that God is making. He is going to present it to himself, a glorious church. See, unconditional love says, I love you no matter what. That's the love you have for your children. You love your kids no matter what they do. But delightful love says, I also delight in you. You can love somebody and not be delightful. But when God looks at us and we have taken on his love, we have been able to be cleansed and sanctified by his spirit and by his power. We manifest the fruit of the spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Someday he can present us to himself a glorious bride, the Bible lets us know that someday we'll be presentable. We'll be there because we'll have a, 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 a robe with no sins on it, no stains attached to it. We'll be spotless before our Lord and our Maker. And so what this life is doing right now, and it's getting rid of all the spots. All the little things that are imperfections that we have. It's presenting us, preparing us for presentation. For the day when he will take his bride and we will sit with him. And Paul said, I have espoused you to one husband. That day is coming. And I begin to close. 1 Samuel 18, 1 to 3, came to pass that when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day. Would not let him go no more to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And I want you to know something here. Interesting about David and Jonathan. When I was younger, I saw Jay, David and Jonathan as being peers. Men of the same age, but they were not. No, they're not. Jonathan was at least 15 years older than David. At the very least, he was much older. But there was something in David that Jonathan saw, and his soul was knit to him. I've had friends over the years, men of God. I have one friend, his name is Bob O'Banion. We are knit together. Our souls are knit together in love. We have a closeness with each other. And that man is every bit as, he's probably 20 years, at least 20 years older than me. But there's a love there that I can't explain it except it's a divine love that comes from God. And God is here today to let that love for, your, for others and the love for him be knit to your soul so that you can make a covenant to him. I want to make that covenant tonight. I want to be full, not just of the love of God, but I want to manifest that love to other people. Jack Kelly, he was a foreign affairs editor in, uh, for USA Today. And in 1992, he witnessed the famine that was going on in Somalia. And they saw a little boy one day. And uh, the photographer had a grapefruit, which he gave to the boy. And the child was so weak, he didn't have the strength to peel the grapefruit, much less to hold it. So they cut it in half and gave it to him. And the, he said the boy picked it up, and he looked at us as if to say thanks, and then he 
just ran or walked back towards the village. He couldn't run. He walked back to the village. So they walked behind him, find out what he was going to do with this grapefruit that he couldn't, he, he couldn't hardly carry. They didn't know he was behind him. They said when they entered the village, there on the ground was a little boy who he thought initially was dead. His eyes were completely glazed over. And it turned out that this was that boy's younger brother. The older brother kneeled down next to his younger brother, bit off a piece of the grapefruit, chewed it. Then he opened up his younger brother's mouth, put the grapefruit in, and worked his brother's jaw up and down. And that older boy had been doing that for the younger brother for about two weeks. A couple days later, the older brother died of malnutrition. And the younger brother lived. He gave his life for his brother. He had it within his means to save himself, but he did not. And I wonder if that is what Jesus meant when he said, there is no greater love than to lay down your life for someone else. To lose ourselves in love to somebody else. That fruitful character is displayed when we love others. And we love God without any concern for ourselves. Now have I perfected that? No, I'm working on it. My model is Jesus Christ. He gave himself for me at Calvary. So it's time to pray. I'd like you to stand with me if you would. I want you just to thank Jesus for the love that he has for you right now. Jesus, I thank you. Thank you Lord. I thank you, Lord, for your love for me tonight. Thank you for me. I thank you, Jesus. I you. Lord, I you. have never deserved one bit of blessing, no, one bit of love. My sins are before me, no. Jesus. I know what I've had to overcome in my own personality, Jesus, and yet you love me. And I thank you for it, Jesus. I thank you for Calvary. I thank you for the cross. I thank you, Lord, for an empty tomb today, Jesus. And I thank you for the gift of the Holy Ghost. I thank you, Lord, that when I was baptized in your name, my sins were completely covered. I was forgiven, Jesus, and I've been justified by you. And I give you praise and glory for that in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Would you come to the front right now? Would you come and close your eyes and raise your hands and just begin to ask him, Lord, help me, Jesus, to seek to love others as you love me. Help me, Jesus, to love the world as you love the world. For God so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son, Jesus, that whosoever believed on you would not perish but have everlasting life. And so I'm asking you, Lord, give me that love. Give me a revelation of your love for me, for my community, for my family, for the church, Jesus. And help me to operate in love. Help me be led by love. Help love, Lord, to be the first thing on my mind. To understand what would Jesus do in this situation? How can I love somebody? How can I love them, Jesus? How can I sacrifice myself? How can I spend myself? What selfless act must I do in love, Jesus, to reach somebody? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, Jesus, it's a glorious church that you've made us a part of, Jesus. But help us to be generous with our love, God. To be liberal with the love that you've given us, Jesus. Not to be stingy with it, God. Oh, Lord, let our bowels of mercy be open to other people. Let our compassion, God, be moved Just as you were moved on by your love and your compassion, and it propelled you, God, to perform the miraculous. Let us be loved. Let us be loving. Let us be full of that dimension of love, Jesus. Yeah, la bossa, ta la bossa, ta. Yeah, la bossa, ta la bossa.